Kia ora koutou katoa, ko rangi toto te maonga, ko Moana Nui Akiwa te Moana no Tamaki Makaurau ahau, uh, ko Ngāti Whātua te iwi, ko, fa- kai- <laughs> ko te Kaiwhakahaere mō ngā mema o Apra Aotearoa ahau, um, ko Victoria Kelly tōko ingoa. Nō reira, teina koutou, teina koutou, teina koutou kātoa. Um, I could not be prouder to be in the company of these women. I'm going to try and talk as little as possible. I doubt I'll have to say very much at all, um, but we're in the middle of Song Hub Sphere, which has been an experience already just over the past two days of such um, solidarity and empowerment and um, kind of calm, happy creativity. And today we're here to talk about uh, the reality of um, the different ways that we find ourselves in minorities in our lives, particularly in a creative life. Um, We have with us visiting from New York City, Ebony Smith, who is a producer. (laughs) Producer and audio engineer in residence at Atlantic Records in New York. We have Rhea Hall, Artivist, performer, artist, writer, broadcaster, wahine toa, and we have Coco Solid. <laughs> now, let me see, novelist, director, raconteur, activist, rapper, performer, artist, writer, I don't know quite how to finish that list. Fierce, amazing mana wahine here, um, and we're going to talk about all of the ways in which these women are affecting change in the areas where they see that change is needed. And I would like to simply begin by asking each of them to talk about their areas of work, um, what they identified as needing to be done, and how they decided to go about doing it. So if I can start with you, Ebony, and ask you, when the moment was that you felt that as a sound engineer and as a producer, as an artist, you wanted to start working not just for yourself, but for all of the people around you that you felt needed to be empowered. Hello, how's everybody? Um, And give it up for I honestly, it was never a decision where I said, now I'm going to activate the activist part of my personality. Um, I was a student in college, and I fell in love with what I do now for a living, which is music production. Um, I'm one of the lucky people, and many of us here may be lucky in that we're able to write songs and make a living doing what we love. And I found that passion in college, doing what college students do, studying, learning about the world, learning about yourself. And I came across the art of music production by way of GarageBand. (laughs) And uh, I was looking for my community And I found on my campus a lot of young men who were into music production. And they were great, they were warm, they were inviting, but I was really curious about whether or not there were other women like myself who were making music on computers, bedroom producers, engineering, recording, self-producing, I was just curious because I thought I was the only woman. And the more I thought about that, I'm in college, you know, my job is to interrogate everything and question every, everything. That assumption seemed far-fetched to me. So doing what college students do, I Googled and I started looking for women producers, female DJs, female audio engineers. And when I did that Google search, I came across shej.net and femix.com and all these incredible communities of women. 
and I started reaching out to them individually to interview them for my senior thesis. And so once I started that project, which was an ethnography on women music producers, I started meeting these incredible women producers who were just like me, who had very unique stories, stories that I felt like other people needed to hear, stories that really encouraged me and empowered me. And so it was really kind of like, I need to connect the dots. And so my desire to start Gender Amplified was never an outward facing initiative. I wasn't looking at sexism and saying, how can I affect change? How can I rid and eradicate this social ill? I was looking very specifically inward at myself and at my community of women who thought and created the same way that I did. And it was out of that that I decided to connect the dots. And coincidentally, that was activism 101. Right? I was trying to solve the problem of these women not knowing each other. You know? And in the same way, I was able to solve the problem of sexism in music production or gender bias in music production because I was creating communities for women to network and record together and find producers that spoke their language and engineers who could support their songwriting. And that in and of itself became its own form of activism. So it was never really a conscious thought. I just saw an opportunity to connect people. And the end result was so much more than I could have imagined. That's such an incredible story. And um, you know, Gender Amplified has become such a powerful force. And you've managed to unify a huge range of musicians and producers as well, um, who are unfortunately often invisible. Yeah. Why do you suppose that they are invisible when they are so great? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, I wrote an article for Billboard earlier this year that was entitled, Where are the Women Producers? And the answer was invisibly everywhere because this room, I'm sure, is full of women producers. You have three on the stage, four. Um, and sometimes we're producing whether or not we know we are. We find it hard to even accept the fact that we're self-producing and or producing for others. When we have ideas, we have a hard time taking ownership for our own ideas. And in that article, I spoke about some very specific things that I think challenge the visibility issue when it comes to women producers. One of the things I think is that sometimes women artists do not properly credit the women that they're working for and the women who have worked for them. So I was astonished when I realized that so many really big artists that I knew of had worked with some really prominent women producers and some not so prominent, but who weren't kind of tooting their praises. And then I thought about some of the male producers like Metro Boomin, if you listen to Drake's music or Future or some of these artists, they shout out the producers in the songs. And this is something that I'm not so much seeing with women producers, and it's one of the, th and women artists, I'm sorry, and it's one of the things that I specifically called out in the Billboard article. If you are a prominent woman artist, and you're not shouting out the women that are producing for you and engineering for you, it's, it's a big problem because it can make such a difference. When Taylor Swift, um, started to call out the women she was working with. It made such a difference in their careers when Beyonce started to do that and really shining a light on the women who are choreographers, who are producers, who are engineers, who are fashion, uh, uh, fashion uh, stylists and some of the other hairdressers. I mean, it really does take a village to make these artists great. And I think in general, sometimes engineers and producers can be invisible in that way and sometimes that's by design. 
But I think there has to be kind of more of an effort on the part of women to really say, look, I'm working with this woman, she's incredible. You should know about her, Beyonce. You should know about her, Rihanna. You should know all these artists should be saying, calling it out. Um, I think another issue that affects women's invisibility has to do with obviously just gender bias. There's a lot of gender bias that's happening at the a &R level, that's happening with the managers, with the publishing companies, who will not take chances on talent that they can't see as being able to do the job. If you look at a woman and you don't see her as being able to do the job, then you're not going to reach out when the opportunity is there to hire. So I think there is this vision of what a producer looks like. You know, skinny jeans, backpack, you know, there's this aesthetic. And sometimes we just don't fit it. You know, I did a beat cipher beat battle earlier this year through my organization, Gender Amplified, and there was a young lady there who is Estonian native, and she's just so meek and just so um, genteel in her presentation. And she plugged her laptop in and started playing her beats, and her beats shattered the whole place. <laughs> you know, and she's just sitting there as her beats are playing. Nobody had a, would have thought in a million years if you saw her on the street that she would have on a hard drive beats that powerful and that amazing. So how often is she getting overlooked when she's in the office for the meeting if she gets the meeting at all? So I think in terms of how we view women and their abilities, we have to open our eyes to see a larger scope that's bigger than this narrow aesthetic that we're used to seeing. We have to say, underneath the surface, if I, pro if I, if I probe a little bit, there's probably something there. You know, so that's another thing, I think. Rhea, <laughs> um, what was the seed of your artivism, which is, I guess, the best word, and a, a great word. It's a, you know, your recent album, Rules of Engagement, is a, an incredible statement and commitment and holistic call to arms, um, which says so many, it's multidimensional. How did you um, arrive upon this way to send your message out into the world? And what was it that made you feel that it needed to happen? Um, well, hello everybody. Um, my name is Ria Hall. <coughs> I'm a uh, artivist, um, which I take very seriously. Um, for those of you that don't know, I released an album uh, at the end of last year called Rules of Engagement, which um, is a concept album, yes, but it's an album that um, really digs deep into historical narrative between com about conflict between the British and Māori back in the 1800s, and in particular um, looks at uh, my own tribe in Tauranga Moana <coughs> and uh, the result of the Waikato Raupatu confiscations of that time. And I use that work to really disseminate um, our current landscape and the, the, the state, this type of New Zealand that we now live in. Um, as you can imagine, um, a very difficult, touchy, somewhat traumatic, yet necessary uh, body of work to, to discuss, uh, particularly in our current climate, um, where disparities and marginalisation is even more present. Um, so I really wanted to use this style of work and um, the rules of engagement which was actually a document scripted in March of 1864 to Sir George Grey 
from a relation of mine, Henare Taratoa. So I used his four rules as the mantra behind how I would weave messages of hope, resilience, uh, rebuttal, um, and um, love, how I would kind of interpret that musically. Um, for a woman to be portraying those histories, those stories, was a very confronting time for me and I spent five years trying to find the strength within myself to be able to comfortably enter into that space. Um, it's a very unique um, situation to enter into a space that's um, the cause of so much uh, pain, particularly with the confiscations and the Raupatu of the 1800s. So to be talking about that through contemporary means as a female was extremely confronting. And I had to pray, I had to karakia, I had to ask myself if it was the right thing to do. I had to ask people for their permission for me to do this work. Um, I had to research very, very hard. And in doing that, I found another version of myself. And I really wanted to carefully, um, but caringly, offer that same light to whomever was willing to listen. So, um, for those of you that aren't too aware of um, how those things might work, I believe in the spiritual realm versus the earthly realm. I believe in the balance that's required um, in those, both of those spaces. I believe that you need to care for your earthly realm and that will translate into the spiritual realm so things here in this space work well and in your favour. And all I really wanted to do was to produce, co-produce, write, co-write, and listen to the people that I had gotten involved. Actually, funnily enough, all men. All men. But in saying that, the likes of Lawton Kora, Tiki Tane, uh, Kings, um, Electric Wire Hustle, an outfit out of Wellington, um, they allowed me to front this in my wahine tanga, first and foremost. And I think that that's a really interesting conversation to have, is we actually need our men in order for us to really solidly occupy the space. It's not just us that need to shout out for ourselves, it's actually the responsibility of our men to ensure that they're singing off the same song sheet. And um, I felt that through this process, through the process of creating that work, and I don't look at, none of us here I'm sure, um, look at what you create as just a song. It's not just a song, it's not just words. You're actually pouring your entire spiritual being into what people are hearing, irrespective of the lightheartedness of a tune, irrespective of the political angle of a tune, you're pouring your absolute whole into that space. So um, I'm really appreciative of the men that I do have, but I'm even more so proud of the fact that as a wahine Māori, who in a sense marginalised as a woman, but marginalised once over again as a Māori. It's an interesting, I really found it a really, uh, actually an empowering time. I think we live in a, real, in a time where we can, I think we live in a time and in a space where we can really embrace everything about who we are. Every single thing about who we are, your skin colour, your hair, where you come from, how you were raised. I was raised by a single man, I'm the youngest of four sisters. Embrace that, don't be afraid of that. 
um, and being a woman. So I hope that kind of semi answers your question. <laughs> I feel like I could go and like fell a thousand trees and <laughs> which brings us to Coco Solid, Jessica Hansel, um, who saw a an imbalance and an and an inequity in our music industry and was moved to begin a media conversation about inequality um, and began a movement called Equalise My Vocals where women, female identifying, non-binary, transgender people were, were able to come together and start creating solidarity and volume for the work that they were doing and the visibility that they had. What was the seed of that? Um. Um, the seed of that was that um, I am me <laughs> and I was in a world and um, I felt, you know, I've been making music since I was uh, 19 and punk bands originally and then it kind of went into rap and it was always kind of an underground and then it kind of visibility found me in different um, voltages throughout my journey. And I kind of arrived at a place uh, with, I think the timing was right. I felt people were finally ready to actually unpack the fact that they weren't safe satisfied, they were, you know, feeling resentful and that I guess the fabric of uh, local music and the way that I was participating in it anyway was, um, it had a lot of problems and it was very, and to some capacity it is still very uncool to say you know, this is really fucked up, I don't like this. And um, I just felt some kind of way, to be honest. And I, I guess I audited how much energy I had to give the conversation. I knew that I had the experience. I knew that I had the support in the community. I knew that there was global conversations happening, but not with the specific Aotearoa you know, every place needs its specific dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I w didn't want to feel like we were at the mercy of cultural conversations that weren't relevant to us. I didn't want to be like a bootleg London, a bootleg America, you know. Mm -hmm. I wanted us to address these issues that were very specific. And um, I think it started in a spiral way from people doing things like naming their abusers and um, talking about how certain clubs were unsafe and talking about how some producers were really difficult to work with and some promoters wouldn't, you know, would book all your bros, everyone around you, but you had to kind of like, for some reason you weren't part of it. Yeah. So it was very like practical, you know, I just kind of looked around me and just went, oh. And it was the same thing, you know, well, if I don't say it, no one's going to say it, you know? And I just happened to kind of, I started an interview series and I just basically picked wahine and um, trans and non-binary people that I knew, people that, my friends. And I would sit down and I would just have a Q&A with them and then I would type it out and then, you know, they would publish it and they would get this really intense reception every time because people, it resonated with people. And um, I did a club night called Queenie Control, and it was the same agenda, you know, you would just kind of prioritise uh, wahine, non-binary, trans people, people of colour, people who were just basically were sick of having to 
pr pretend that they weren't having a hard time when they were participating in the machine of playing live or participating in the machine of being a studio musician. It was a space where you could actually take your wig off. And um, of course that got a good response as well because I, I just think it was timing. It was just saying something that needed to be said at a particular time. I didn't realise it would gain the velocity that it did. Um, but I'm glad it did because that's my, that's my truth, you know. I'm not, I'm not posturing about these belief systems. Um, these are like integral things that I was, I've been like this since I was five, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so it was very fluent for me to just be able to dialogue about that. Yeah. And the musicians that I interviewed for the panels and the shows afterwards um, with my friend Trixie Darko, we, um, we were really just doing, keeping it at a whānau community friendship level, you know. I didn't necessarily have visions of grandeur, if anything, I wanted to reduce everything back to its nucleus of, it's really simple to treat people with respect. It's really not that hard. <laughs> It's fascinating because across all three of you, there's this sense that one voice is like the first grain of an avalanche, you know? And as soon as you say, this is my experience, this is how I see things, this is the unfairness and the inequity that I witness, other people hear and they go, yes, that's right, me too. And, and I've seen that and felt that and it's all around us. How did you find that once you, Ebony, began to activate, um, how did people join you? How did that <coughs> momentum gather to become an organisation and a force which then went from New York to other places and then throughout America and other places elsewhere as well? Well, you know, with regard to Gender Amplified, I like to say it's my God work because it's been quite effortless finding support. And Gender Amplify predates um, our current uh, interest in gender bias. And this latest wave of, of feminist discourse, um, because I started Gender Amplified in 2007. And it was really an outgrowth of my studies. So that was the first place I found support. Unfortunately, I went to a really great university and college, and my college advisor was the first person to see me and to see my passion for music production and for women's rights and women's issues and human rights. And the very first Gender Amplified event was actually sponsored by my college. I found support through various departments on the campus, women's studies. We had a women's uh, center for research that supported and provided administrative support as well as financial support. One of our college deans also contributed some money um, to the initiative in addition to a number of student organizations. And honestly, these people found me they heard about what was going on and they wanted to get involved. And that trend has followed no matter where I've been. So first starting with my college, then when I went to grad school, I had a similar experience. Then when I graduated from there and started working, I found support for my initiatives at various places of work with various employers. It's all been the same experience, and now my current job, Atlantic Records, um, which is a subsidiary of Warner Music Group, funds Gender Amplify. So throughout my career as a student, as a music producer, I found support for this without really asking, and that's why I say it's my God work because when you're on the appropriate path, um, the universe conspires to support you if you're doing the mission of your existence here on the planet. And for whatever reason, I keep seeing all the stars align 
in very powerful ways. And I don't have to speak very long about Gender Amplified before people say, you know, there's something here. And I think what it does as a consciousness is it speaks to the, the emptiness that affects all of us when there's imbalance. Gender Amplified is not a women's initiative. It's a consciousness that really asks people to think very critically about how we are distributing resources, how we are supporting each other, how we are seeing each other, how we are communicating, and the nature in which all those things affect how we are making music, how we are participating in studio practices, how we are even building and supporting the institution and the infrastructure of the music business because everything really does come down to the records we make. And so how are all of these more cerebral and metaphysical, societal, cultural issues, societal issues affecting how we do that? And I think it really does end up being, when you look at it from that perspective, a, a process that really does affect all of us, not just women, not just men, not just black, not just white. I think Gender Amplified is really providing that. So I found support from men, I found support from women, I found support from people of various races, I found corporate support as well as grassroots and community support because there is a, a center focus on balance, equity, and an egalitarian focus on how we are supporting one another. And I'm doing that from the perspective of what I know best, which is music production, music making, music creating. But it really is bigger than that, you know. So I think I've, I've been on the right path and I found support because of that. Um, you know, one of the things that music really does have as a great strength is its ability to be loud, to make sound, to connect in ways that people often find it hard to connect because there's an abstraction and there's a resonance about it that draws people together and reveals people to each other. Rhea, <laughs> did I give you a fright? <laughs> um, you and I were talking earlier and you said something really powerful about the call <clears throat> and how when you uh, perform, it's not just about singing, it's about everything <coughs> behind that, all of the things that resonate in your voice. Can you elucidate that for everybody because it was just such an amazing idea? Um. One of the things that I um, do my best to do is to try and emulate uh, what I know, um, what I grew up in from a traditional context and try and emulate that same state or those same feelings in a contemporary context. <coughs> so um, we were talking about uh, roles on the marae and in order for any group to step onto a marae the first port of call literally is from is from the mouth of a woman mm. Sweet. so the kaikaranga calls you in um, and without that there's no movement there's no speeches there's no interaction uh, there's no meeting each other and so um, I try and use that same thought process, that same whakaro, that, that thought um, within my own mahi, within my own work. Um, but it's not just about throwing your voice out for the sake of throwing your voice. When I was speaking to Victoria earlier today about throwing your voice, your voice actually might be silence or your voice might be a political statement that you want to make in a certain way, or it might be about social commentary of the day. Um, it's however you choose to interpret your voice and to interpret um, 
the messages that you want to portray. Um, so I, I try very hard to emulate the goings on on a marae setting into what I do in my own work. Um, and that can be easily translated to um, from setting to setting. Whether or not I do it in English, whether or not I do it in Māori, whether or not it's on the marae, whether or not it's on some other kind of stage in a contemporary context. It's all applicable. Um, and so I try to sit comfortably in the space of the kaikaranga, where I am embracing and encompassing in its total form the role of the woman. <laughs> so once that call gets made, you know, and, and you did this, Jessica, when you um, put the call out for Equalise My Vocals, because yes, you created these interviews and everyone read them and then everyone responded to them and then began the kind of planning and realisation of the event that you created around that and the gathering of people and the conversations that you engendered through that process. So it's like it was like a waterfall really, wasn't it? Can you maybe talk about then what happened when all of these people came together and added their voices to yours? Um, I'm just, yeah, feeding off what uh, these two uh, Hine have said. I think um, a common thread that runs through all of my undertakings in life is a storytelling capacity. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, oratory genealogy. You know I have major oratory genes, <laughs> for better or for worse, you know, <laughs> ask them in the studio today. But um, I just think I have, um, a, a, it's a comfort zone of sorts. I don't feel, um, uh, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's a difficult, um, hard thing that I need to overcome to unpack the psychic situation with other people. Mm. You know, that is actually something that I intuitively accidentally do all the time. And um, in all mediums that I work in, the, um, yeah, it's actually the conversation and the narrative and the, I guess, the unfurling of things unseen that I like to um, put into the light. Uh, whether that's actually uh, a detective kind of thing, I, I don't think so. I actually just believe because we are often uh, have other people's stories superimposed over ours all the time as um, marginalised people, whether it's your gender, you know, your race, just your, all your disposition. If you know what that feels like, you are very familiar with the fact there's more to this story and there's more to every story. So I think every context I'm in, I kind of appraise it, like what, what do we actually all have to unpack? What is it that isn't being said? And I just really go with my intuition as to, yeah, I, I just enjoy that dynamic with the world as well and other people that I engage with. I just like to basically have a, um, and we were talking about it today, you know, like small talk is just like, oh, it's such a drag, you know. I just, I want to get to the nucleus of what really makes ship pop, what really is, like why are we here, why are we creating, and what kind of light work can we do today? You know, that's really, like that is my jam. I don't have long hair, so that's what I'm gonna commit myself to. That's, that's kind of a, a second nature disposition of mine is, is um, yeah, depth and investigation, and how can we actually, like, elevate a situation that can be, and often the answer is so simple, you know, like acknowledging other people mm -hmm. and um, acknowledging people's pain and stories and, you know, just basically 
you know, bringing in the meek Estonian producer who doesn't say anything and just going, why don't you play some of your shit? I know you've got something, you know? <laughs> and it's, it's really like, inclusivity is such a buzzword now. People think it is really just, you know, a real tick boxes, get a, you know, get a couple of people in here, we'll, we'll be good. But in actuality, inclusivity is really about that, is like how can I, how is the situation in unobvious ways, how can it be improved? And that's our job, I think, as artists, to really go into and sense that there's more to the story. And if you are a storyteller, that's literally your job. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. I know that there are going to be lots of people here who have questions, and I just want to let you know that they're welcome. So at any point, if you want to ask something, please go right ahead. I don't want to, like, hog the conversation too much, not give you a chance to ask all of the things that you're curious to know. Um, so just put your hands up or call out if you want to ask something. Um, one of the things that we've talked about a lot over the past couple of days, or at least I should say I've been talking a lot with other with many of the participants at Song Hub Sphere about is that sense that when, and it kind of goes back to the Estonian producer idea too, that when you are in any kind of a minority, um, the voices that tend to make the biggest impact are the loud, um, resilient, determined, forceful voices, and those words have been coming up a lot. But not all people in a community or a group of any kind are like that. And so when a minority is being represented, it tends to be represented by one kind of voice. And there are lots of other voices that continue to be difficult to hear, you know, like, and, and, and unless somebody else creates space, forges a pathway, opens a door, those voices are in danger of not being heard. Ebony, in, in your experience with Gender Amplified, what are the voices that are starting to come through that door now that it's open? I think that there's this idea that you have to be forceful and almost like a, a settler in a way. You have to be kind of like a cowboy, you know, Western settler to, this is a United States reference, I'm sorry. Um, to break through the wilderness of people who are out there looking to get their music heard. And, and traditionally that has been true. I think the internet has become a real democracy. It's the only real democracy, I think, that exists in the world. The only real place where everybody exists on the same level and there's access to the same resources at the same time. And it is through that that so many women, especially, but not just women, a lot of marginalized groups, even disabled individuals um, and trans individuals and members of the LGBTQAI community are starting to find visibility in all types of ways, not just when it comes to music production, but specifically when it comes to music production, you're seeing a lot of voices who are becoming very loud on the internet, but then when you meet them, and this is not just pertaining to men, I'm sorry, this is not just pertaining to women, I've noticed even men who are soft-spoken, you know, some producers I've met who are not big-time personalities at all. They're not the, you know, DJ Khaled's and the P. Diddy's, you know. They just want to make their music. But the music has been able to speak for the individual because everybody can put their tracks on the internet. And I think in particular, a lot of self-producing female artists have found a means of expressing themselves and finding audiences because the reality is when you have so many people on the internet at once, they're all looking for something different. 
and they may be looking for the exact thing that you're producing. And so artists, producers have been able to find a niche, cultivate that niche, people who really see them without seeing them. You know, they see them through hearing them. And I think it's been very, very, very empowering in addition to the conversations that can start online. I've met so many artists, specifically through Gender Amplified. There's Kiran Gandhi. I don't know if you know, Kiran Gandhi is an American music producer, artist, activist, um, who basically started a campaign focusing on reproductive justice and has subsequently become a musician and a producer and has been using the internet to push forth an agenda through music um, that is specific to women's liberation. So only in the internet age, right? Only in cyberspace can you marry free bleeding, reproductive justice, music production, you know, and all the things that she's been able to curate under the umbrella of her brand. Only in the internet age can that happen. She's a member of the Gender Amplified community and a Gender Amplified alum. And there's so many artists like that who are multi-hyphenated um, and have multiple disciplines within their activism and multiple disciplines within their creative process. So I don't know, I think the internet kind of, kind of helps, you know, various artists have been finding a way, um, have been breaking through. And I'm glad that Gender Amplify has been able to highlight and align with some of those women. You know, that idea of using multiple mm -hmm. skills, multiple versions of yourself to spread the same message is, very resonant, I think, here in New Zealand where our artistic population and particularly the audience is small. So, you know, the local audience is small and when you're beginning your work, you're um, reaching out to an audience that in today's kind of commercial environment can't sustain you. So as a response to that, we often find ourselves taking on many roles, many mantles, and attempting to get our message out in many, many different ways. I mean, Rhea, you in, in many ways are doing that yourself as a writer, as a performing artist, as a broadcaster, as a, you know, as a, as a kapahaka exponent, as a cultural advocate, as almost like a political warrior, you're getting your message out in many, many ways. How do you juggle? How do you unify? How do you um, create such a kind of a wide spectrum of voices and direct them in a single way? Um, yeah. I feel like if you're a person who really is convicted and lives in your truth, um, that that voice in itself cuts through anything. And that's kind of the angle that I like to, uh, that I prefer to, to come from. I won't say anything online that I don't believe in with everything that I am. I, I'm not a shit talker. I don't do small talk like sis. <laughs> I'm someone that, um, and I'm extremely passionate and convicted about every single aspect of what I do because you have to be. Mm -hmm. You have to be. And in this artistic and creative space, it's actually our duty yeah. to do so. And even more so as women, the bearers of the next generation, the mothers, the aunties, the grandmothers, the great grandmothers and the lines of descent that we come from. If we uh, aren't occupying that space wholeheartedly, then we are just doing that line a disservice. And so um, 
I just believe in completely occupying those spaces with everything that I am. And I encourage everyone, especially our young women and those who feel like they don't have a voice, if you have a truth, I think it's the time for you to enable yourself to activate that truth. And I think that um, these ladies up here and many other ladies that are in the audience that I've had the pleasure of working with informally or formally are great advocates for that, fantastic advocates for that. So, um, yeah. What else, Jessica, do you reckon that each and every one of us can do to create the reality that we want to see expressed in the world? Um, just to follow up on Rio's Kuriro, um, you know, a lot of people talk to me about my penchant for the multidisciplinary, you know, and it's like Wall Street broker slang, diversify your bonds. I don't, I don't think people realise that's actually uh, a coping mechanism and a survival tactic, especially in somewhere like Aotearoa, if you are a creative person, you best get some extra skills up your sleeve or you ain't gonna work. You know, you ever, met, yes. you ever encounter that guy who's like, I'm gonna write the great New Zealand novel. I'm like, mm, well, you're gonna be broke. I hope you've got a job. You know, I'm just being practical yeah. and I'm just being honest. I'm a really good receptionist. Yeah, I'm a great telemarketer. That's how I got the rapper voice. But it's, you know, I just feel yeah. That, that conversation um, often comes up like, oh, I'm just, I'm just such a creative polymath. That's, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I live and breathe my art 24 seven. It's like, I'm trying to pay my rent. Yeah. You know, I have like, I have people, I have a community to support and amplify. Like I have to find outlets and, you know, art a reason which I can do that. And so, you know, the, the second tier to that conversation was about enabling other people visibility and whatnot, which is also, you know, another buzzword, but it's actually a really simple thing, kopapa, to encompass. And, I, you know, I never speak for anyone other than myself. I feel that that's kind of like rule number one. I don't ever claim to speak for the what many people think is the monolithic glut of women. You know, we are very, just like Māori, we are, it's a spectrum, it's varied. And what I do do though, is if I do have a platform in which I speak for myself and I accrue any kind of privilege or benefit from being able to speak to power for myself, any surplus benefit or privilege that I accrue I dedicate that to the people that I know are not getting the same leverage or exposure as me. And so I know who those communities are. And I feel like that is where people start to slip when they start to elect themselves as like a wrestling ultimate warrior, ultimate oppressed, you know? Yeah. There's always somebody else who can actually benefit from what it is you're doing. I am always trying to in any possible way uh, involve organically other people who don't have the same fortunate platforms that I do. You know, I'm in a collective called Whānau, Spa Whānau with a F, and um, we have a lot of, uh, you know, we have Fafa Whenge and Whaatama, Whaatama in our group, and these are brilliant musicians and brilliant vocalists. We have, we are from all over the world, all of us. And this is, you know, a way of working with some of my favorite people in the world, but it's also a way of me sharing the privilege that I've, I have as a recording artist now. And it's also a way of, you know, mentoring, I think is a really powerful way for me to do that. It's a really practical f way for me to kind of like, you know, be climbing up and surviving, but also passing down any surplus gold that I get, because I feel that that, that is your duty. 
And um, for me, that, that effectively answers your question. You know, you want to talk about how do you make the world a better place. It's like you share power, you share resources, you know, you respect boundaries, and you, you do anything you can to make this a communal affair. Anything individualistic, you know, that's too, it's a capitalist strategy for me. I, I, it's not natural to me. It's a colonial strategy for me. And I think that's the kind of the plight of the individual, the singular musician, the star, which, let's be real, like men have been riding on that for a long time. But as you see women uh, gain more visibility in this medium, you see the, we just are so inherently and naturally inclined to just want to share and open up the conversation a bit more. And, you know, I want to see more, um, yeah, more, more trans people involved in these gender conversations. I want to see more non-binary people actually talking about playing with the idea of what gender even is. You know, we're coming from a very wahine-centric place, and we should be, because, you know, that's how we all identify. But we need to be always kind of just like passing that, that mic along. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Bella. Oh. <laughs> oh, hey, uh, thank you people so much for the program. We really enjoyed this chat. Thank you. Um, I was just picking up on what you were talking about about um, internet being the only democracy. Like, I would definitely agree with that. But at the same time, I think it's undeniable the targeted advertising that goes on and all of the, I guess, like foundations of capitalism that exist within the internet sphere. But I guess my question to all of you is your thoughts on essentially the commodification of feminism and the commercialization of it that we're seeing nowadays in the music industry and the fashion industry and the arts industry. I think we've talked about inclusivity being a buzzword and visibility and things like that. And in a positive sense, it increases visibility, which is really good. You can't argue with that more people that see it for better. But at the same time, when we talk about these big companies supporting these essentially grassroots movements, is it just a really capitalist approach to essentially like a life-saving movement for a lot of people? I just would like to know your experience. I'll, t I'll take it first because I have so much to say. <laughs> first thing to say, I'm trying not to lose all my thoughts, is when I go into h and Embassy of Feminism, t-shirt with the definition of feminism wrong yeah. on the shirt, I have a problem with that, right? The commodification of lifestyles, the commodification of movements, the commodifications of, the commodification of terminology, the co-opting of terminology that has been coined for a reason, right, um, is problematic. That's point number one, so I'm with you there. Um, the second thing is, you know, I was here in my hotel room and I got this email, and um, it's about another an event where they want me to come and talk, you know, the organizers, and it's because they need, we're doing a women's thing, we need a, you know, women's engineer. <laughs> You need a black, do you have a black? <laughs> you know, like li literally, like this is what's happening to me now because of the inclusivity, right? We need a black, we need a trans, we need a person rolling up in a wheelchair, we need, you know. And I looked at that email and I said to myself, is this the only reason these people are calling me? Is because I'm a black and I'm a woman and I have breasts and like ovaries and I can talk to these issues. Um, and then immediately I go, motherfucker, it doesn't matter why they're calling you. Like, go, you know, go. It doesn't matter why they're calling you. The, a door is open for you to speak truth. And we don't know how long that door is gonna be open. 
So speak the truth as loudly as you possibly can in this moment because it needs to be heard and it doesn't matter why people are wanting to listen. If there's a moment to be honest, be honest while people are listening because that message will fall on the ears that need to hear it. You know, there's some little girl somewhere that's gonna be at that women's thing that I'm gonna be speaking at whenever I'm gonna be speaking because they need a black and a woman and a trans and a, so what? People need to hear, people need to see, and while the door is open, let's ensure that it stays cracked. Because somebody's gonna come and put a big old toe in there, and it's gonna be permanently open. That's really the hope, right? And I think the other thing I think is important to keep sight of is that I somewhat feel that this is not a way because, you know, if you've ever studied feminism, there traditionally have been three waves. And there seems to be like a fourth wave that's happening at the moment. And at every point in the chronological trajectory of feminism as an arc, you've seen the commodification of it because there are opportunists in the world. There are people who want to jump on a bandwagon. But at the same time, every moment in history has resulted in considerable amount of progress that has not been undone. Right? You know, we can all still vote in the, you know, in the United States. I'm sorry, I'm not as versed in, you know, the New Zealand politics and the suffrage movement here, but in the United States, we can still vote. You know, we still have reproductive rights. I mean, there, there, there are issues with that, but, but there are certain milestones that have not been um, taken away, that have not been undone. So even if progress is incremental and comes in waves, I think there are things that do stick. And the important thing is just to see the silver lining in all of it, because even if, the definition of feminism is wrong on the t-shirt. My hope is that H&M is selling to a young girl who will grow up and do her own research. It's better than saying, you know, go somewhere and cook a cake for your man on a t-shirt. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'll take what I can get. <laughs> Yeah, um, I just think of that Jenny Holzer mantra, abuse of power comes as no surprise. You know, um, you have, I think, anything that has uh, authenticity and um, comes from a place of, um, yeah, has revolutionary, revolutionary leverages going to appeal to the psyche and the hearts of uh, humankind. And of course, somebody wants to secure the bag and monetize that, you know? Someone's gonna be like, ooh, you know? It's kind of like the aesthetic of those work people. I think that we need to put that in a Pepsi ad, you know? It's, it's very much um, second nature, unfortunately, to the, um, to the, yeah, the capitalist, white supremacy, patriarchal kind of thing we got going on. And um, yeah, the, 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 the battle against that, even the word battle I think is reductive. It's a constant uh, daily intention and consciousness that you have to enter into to be yourself. Like, you know, that whole, um, you know, Audrey Lord thing, self care is a radical act. You know, we have to kind of like always return to ourselves and just be like, okay, today I'm going to do my best, that's, that's what I'm going to do, that's cool. The, the, you know, that's a conscious thing as an individual and we have to always kind of basically assess and analyse and interrogate people who want to place value on us, the external 
value that people think that you hold. And that's shifting all of the time, you know, that, that flux, and now even more than ever, because, you know, I'm, uh, as a, as a feminist, you know, still I do chafe under that label sometimes because I feel like it still doesn't really encompass a lot of value systems that for me culturally I was brought up in. It needs to be, everything needs to be contextual. Everything needs to be a case-by-case -case basis. Everything needs to be like analysed as uh, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about people co-opting your value. People do it to us racially all the time. People are like, you know, the same, you know. Mm. We're having a woman's suffrage, you know, conversation and we would like you to be a part of it. I'm like, yeah, because I'm so passionate about women's suffrage. You know, no, it's not. That didn't really... Th there's a whole lot of individualistic problems that I think people want to assess you mm. like we are all the same. We ain't the same, no. and it's our our kind of duty is our power, really, our superpower, yeah. is yes. to remind people we ain't all the same. Mm. Mm. Yes, say, <laughs> sister, say. Well, just to quickly add on to that, all the shit is egocentric. Eh? All the yeah. stuff is egocentric. So it's about yeah. trying to break down yeah. that. It's, a, it's not even about other people trying to speak about who you are intrinsically and your truth. It's not the job of anyone else to decide that for any of us. Mm. We understand implicitly within ourselves who we are and who we choose to be. That's your freedom as a human being. And I think that that's what it needs to go back to, to our human being selves, to, um, to an innate aroha, in a care, and just being a good person, pretty much, at the end of the day, that respect, that tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's all I've kind of got to say to that, but just to love each other. There's not enough of that around, let's, let's be honest about that. Yeah, chat. Mm, yeah. I, I feel like, you know, um, that's so true, like you get really branded a, an activist, often, you know, rightly so, sure, okay, guilty. <laughs> but um, you get branded that for being a good person. Right. And it's, it's just strange right. to me, you know? It's like you don't actually have to do that much to be considered radical these days. You just have to, <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> A question that came up when we were talking I was, I, with a number of other people and it, the question that came up was would you prefer to be a token or would you prefer to be invisible? And of course the answer has to be well fuck I'd rather be a token because at least I've got a shit show then right? I can stand up and I can say I'm going to take this tiny little opportunity, this tiny wedge of light coming through the door to try and just wedge it open just that little bit much further and then hopefully someone else can get through too and then between us we can wedge it a bit more and then we can wedge it a bit more and then it's open for everybody. Um, as long as you're able to prevent, you know, prevent the uh, justification of further tokenism rather than just an open door. Yeah. Yes. It depends on the traumatising factor for me. <laughs> I, I see it's how much is, am I going to be traumatised by, by this and how much is it really, you know, like how, I have to really consider all the elements. I think that's true, but I definitely have been in a lot of erasing conversations and, um, you know, had my value really reduced and questioned that now I think um, that question is, it, it oscillates for me, yeah. Yes. Um, this is maybe slightly off topic to most of the things you've touched on so far, but um, I feel like it's kind of central to being a woman, not just in the music industry, but anywhere. Um, don't know how to word it, but I'm interested in, in your experience and opinion on this in particular. 
particular looking at it in the kind of upper echelons that you do in the industry. Uh, Suzanne Vega came and spoke to us yesterday, right, and Victor and I asked her about becoming a mother in the music industry and how did you do that and how did you deal with that? And her answer was, it was really fucking hard and it still is, like forever. And I just felt all the mothers go, wow. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, I don't, I don't know if, uh, if you have kids, I know, I know you guys don't, but I've got two kids and I feel like a lot of the issues women face in the world generally, at a conscious or subconscious level, comes back to the fact that we get pregnant and we bear children and then we're expected to take on this whole other role and become, take our focus off ourselves and off parents, all these other kind of pulls and pushes and expectations and you should be this but also this and we're experiencing this right now with our Prime Minister who, I don't know if you know about the Blair Riot country, has just had a baby. And I keep seeing all these photos of her on the front page of the newspaper holding a baby and looking really motherly and I feel like if a male in the same position had just had a baby, you'd still see photos of him in a suit looking powerful and mm -hmm. this and that. And, and the lens people put on that is really interesting to me and I, I just feel like as women, once we have children, we're expected to just fucking disappear and just go <laughs> to that role. And I'm just wondering if you have any experience of witnessing positive outcomes of women having children and then becoming more empowered, or the opposite, but just, yeah. you know, how you kind of experience that. Well, a few things. Um, I don't have any kids. And for me, it's a good thing because my hours are unbelievable. You know, I can barely make time for the person I'm dating. We have, you know, a conversation at least every two weeks about my work schedule. And um, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. The CEO um, of the COO, I'm sorry, uh, Chief. Uh, operating officer of Atlantic Records is a supporter of Gender Amplified and she came and gave a talk about the, the stress and even in some cases the trauma of trying to have it all and I think the thing I took away the most was that she said you can't have it all. You can't have it all. And that resonated with me because I'm in uh, the, the time where I'm probably, if I'm going to start a family, I'm probably going to do it within the next five to eight years. And it's not something I've thought very deeply about, but if I'm going to do it, I need to start thinking about it. And I haven't thought about it much because I've been in the studio. I've been literally underneath a recording console for like 10 years. So I've had to give up a lot of things, including dating, um, including thoughts of motherhood, marriage. It just has not been on my radar because I've been chasing these other stars and I've gotten them. And they're just real basic, right? They really do pale in comparison to having children. And this is not just for women, this is for men. I've seen many of my male colleagues say, you know, I want to get home to my kid. And being in a 12 and 15 hour session where whoever they're at the mercy of wants to do one more take or 10 more takes and just wanting to get home to the kid, just wanting to get home to the wife, it is just a struggle. One thing I do notice with men is that most of my male colleagues have girlfriends or wives. And I find it rare that women have husbands that do what I do. Or kids. And full disclosure, when I decided to incorporate Gender Amplified in the United States, you need partners to do that. 
and I signed on a woman who had been extremely supportive, and then she had a kid during the middle of the incorporation process. And it's been literally two years of her being missing in action. And I'm just now getting her back. And she's got, you know, because the, the, the baby is now at a kind of place where she can be kind of self-sufficient and she can start to kind of re-emerge as a support system for me. But, you know, Erica is her name. She had to ditch me for two years. And I said, go, do what you gotta do. Because I get it. I don't get it because I have gifts, but I get it because I'm a woman. You know, so that's just what it is. Does it mean that we have to not make music? No. Does it mean that we can't have families? No. But I do think we have to start envisioning support systems for each other to make sure that we can get it all done. If you have women producers in your, your, your world who get it, you know, and I'm not saying that you don't, but I'm just saying in general for the group, start envisioning the support system that you need of people who understand what you're doing. Because at every level, there's some version of this. I went to Washington in New York City, I'm sorry, Washington in the United States, and I spoke with a congresswoman who's a five-time congresswoman from one of our states, South Carolina. And she's saying the same thing. She's saying the same thing. People don't get that I have to go to Congress and be a legislator. People are like, why aren't you at home, like fixing dinner and your kids crying? You know, it's like, in every sector, in every industry, there's this issue of how are women <coughs> making it happen? I don't think it's impossible. Um, you bring up the issue is part of the battle. A lot of women do not talk enough about the fact that they need, we need help. We need help. And if you're a woman pr producing, it's just a lot of work, so how are you gonna get it all done? You know, um, if you have to have a, a group chat of women producers just like you and everybody's gotta rotate, you know, babysitting, on days you don't have sessions and somebody else picks up the kid, then that's what it has to be. Because being a woman is a responsibility. Even when you are pregnant, that's a giving process. That's a responsibility, and it's a great responsibility. It gives us so much, I think, that's unique to us that we can then put in the music. So I don't think it has to be one or the other, but it definitely has to be a consciousness and we have to start thinking very critically about how we can get it all done and create, create our support systems. I have a couple of answers. Well, no, not answers. Um, thoughts about that. I've got three children. Um, the really challenging thing about being a composer, a creative person of any kind, and having children is that in order to, or at least in my own personal experience, in order to be able to create meaningfully, you need to be able to see an idea through to a fruition that concludes itself in your natural time frame. So you want to be able to have a moment where you can begin working in, on an idea and get yourself to a point where you can leave it for a while. And there is not a baby in the world that respects that time frame. <laughs> and there is not baby in the world that you can schedule to coincide with that time frame either and that just makes it very very hard and um, as even if you could schedule a baby to work in with your intellectual time frame you might be able to achieve that scheduling for your child find yourself without any good idea to follow through once they're quiet or asleep and um, there is no answer to that conundrum. I guess my, my thing is, I feel like men don't experience the same thing. Like they have no. children, they just carry on. Just like, and now I'm back at work and there's no issue. I, um, I went to the New Zealand Film Awards last year and Mariama McDowell won Best Actress. And uh, she has, you know, two kids. And she had this amazing speech. 
and she just said, um, if you want your performers and your crew to your wahine crew to be amazing, start factoring in childcare and systems within industries that actually acknowledge the fact, you know, it's like mothers are made to feel like, keep it out of you, there's nothing yeah, to see no. here, I don't have two kids, who's that? You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, you're talking about someone else. And I think like, what the fuck is that about? And uh, you know, I, I went to work the other day and um, my friend was lacerating himself because he had uh, taken a plastic bag from the supermarket and he was like, I'm just trying to be eco-friendly, I've just, I took the plastic <laughs> bag. You know, and he was really beating himself up. I'm like, are, are you gonna internalize a whole kind of power structure and our <laughs> dependence on plastics historically for years and years? You're gonna really like take that on board and blame yourself? And <laughs> he was like, oh, I am. I'm like, that's really not your fault that plastic is every fucking where, you know? <laughs> so don't, you know, let that go, like make peace with it try better next time but I feel like the really like the dark equivalent of that for mothers is the same they're literally internalizing blame for yes. industries and situations that are forcing them to pretend that they're not doing the most sacred work yeah, ever yeah. which is you know like bringing more of us into the world and taking care of us and trying to create healthy human beings. Like, for me, I think it's like an actual radicalization of all industries actually factoring in the, f factoring in the fact people are fucking born. Yeah. <laughs> and people give birth to them and they should look after those people. But also I think too that this is more than one generation's work. It's actually beyond our generation to address this issue. My husband, for example, his parents were a traditional family. His father worked, his mother stayed at home and looked after the children. My husband is at least 50% of everything that happens in our household. He is an emancipated, engaged man. He does the primary caregiving while I'm at work. We make our schedules work. We have a very modern family in that respect. But even so, we struggle. It's a cause of conflict. Um, it's a cause of consternation, not just for each of us individually and us as parents, but for our kids as well as we struggle with it. And they watch us struggle. But they're learning from us that we, force, we, we are trying to visualise and realise a balance. And by, in our flawed, fucked up way, trying to create and failing sometimes and succeeding at other times, every now and then we get it right. And our kids see it and hopefully that makes them think that they can hope to achieve it. And that's a step ahead of what our parents showed us. And by the time that they're raising children, you know, I'm imagining three generations from now, which is bad news for us as individuals, but not bad news for our DNA, you know, that we'll get to a point where there is a true, balanced approach to the creation of, of new human beings from society that doesn't rely on such um, predicated roles. Those, um, those letters, but yeah, I don't know how does it work for 
Um, ka whawhai tonu mātou. It's like, that's in the contract of being Māori, I think. It's a struggle without end. And you just have to always appraise everything for the future. That's my philosophy anyway. Um, I don't think, I think plateauing and, you know, kind of reaching a stage of yeah, this is, this is me, I think, you know, I have, I don't think that's really who I am. Um, I think that's a form of psychic death for me. Um, I'll always be interrogating and, um, yeah, un unwrapping what, what is possible for myself and for others. Um, uh, it's probably um, subject to change just because I have the um, ability to do that at this time but um, I think even if I was limitations were to kind of restrict the freedoms that I have and the voice that I have now I'm sure I'd find a way you know it's it's part of who I am it's part of who we are I think yeah that's my philosophy mm. yeah I think survivance mode kicks in eh? um, you find mechanisms you find ways, you, you draw support from your own networks or networks that you can tap into through your other networks and so forth and so on and try and create a system, a system for want of a better word, by where you are able to thrive. Um, I know for myself, um, well I can clearly speak for myself in this forum, but um, it's an interesting conversation that we have, you know, with your fellow mates that are in the same industry as you, and you're like really interested in, to, in what everyone is up to, because it's not an easy situation to be in. It's not a, it's not the um, ideal, ideal career path of choice. My father used to say to me, "Oh, girl, when are you going to get yourself a real job?" And then I get myself a real job, and you say, "How? Oh, I thought you were singing." You know, so it was kind of like a double-edged sword there. But it, it's that kind of um, mentality, um, the survivance mentality that you really need to adopt. And I think that's what we're all doing anyway. Naturally, in this current climate, we're trying to survive. Shit is difficult. Times are hard. So um, yeah, I hope that kind of helps to answer a bit of your partosis. But amazing to have mum of six. Incredible. Any mum is in, in the audience. Amazing. I think that we are coming to the end of our time. I did see a question up here though. Would you like to ask your question and then I'll just ask everyone if there's anything else that they want to add. Just a fanning out question please. To all the beautiful wainies. Mm -hmm. um, got a separate question for all three of you. Oh boy. Uh, to Ebony, I hear that you've worked with uh, Lauren Hill Ooh. and uh, Janelle Nay and Prince. My question, <laughs> <laughs> no. So my question no, is, what was it like working with them? To mm. so you, real? Nice family, you sis. Oh, I can't really loved your performance on the opening ceremony for the World Cup. Oh, so my question is to you, what did you do to prep for that? And what was it like being in the midst of that atmosphere? And for you, Coco, you mentioned earlier something to do with um, not wanting to be a fake or, sorry, I'm paraphrasing, a fake London or a fake um, American Whatever. Um, it sounded like you were going through some season in your career where you were struggling or you're finding it challenging to find your truth or your, your own voice because of how powerful the influence of Europe and America and what they're doing for us here in Aotearoa. So I just wanted to know if you did go through that challenge, what did you do to overcome it? Awesome, bro. So those are my good questions. Sure. Come on down. Thank you. Uh, thank you, brother. Those were some really great, well-researched questions. Thank you. Um, and that was sincere. Um, 
working with Lauren Hill, working with Janelle Monet. Mm. Wonderful experiences, you know. Um, I grew up wanting to work with both of them. And to have the opportunity to do that was just uh, unbelievable. Got an opportunity to work on Dirty Computer. I recorded uh, Screwed with uh, Zoe Kravitz. Um, got an opportunity to work with Lauren Hill, uh, who, you know, is just such an inspiration to me. Um, when I was a kid, I picked up The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. And really that album gave me a sense of the sonic possibilities because there was nothing like it. And it was at a time when I didn't know anything about production. And I certainly didn't know that I would end up making records for a living. But I knew that there was something there worth chasing. And I listened and I, I read the booklet and the liner notes and I learned so many vocabulary words. Um, just reading the lyrics and I heard things that she would do with so many vocalized, vocal devices, so such rich vocalization that she did in terms of her performance, but also the production was something that I think taught me that there was something called sonic sophistication on every level, from a lyrical perspective, from arrangement, from composition, from recording, from the technical excellence that was displayed on that record. And there was something there worth chasing and without knowing, I think I started to chase. Um, so the opportunity to work with her in the studio and have her riffing on Zion in the studio, and it sounding like it was free concert, you know? It was literally a free Lauryn Hill concert. And that was the longest session um, that I've ever done in one shot, 24 hours. And it was very demanding. Um, but I got a selfie in the end. <laughs> experience was well worth it. I was on my way out of the studio. I was like, I'm getting my selfie on. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely wonderful. And I've had so many experiences over my career that were, you know, pinch myself moments. And that's definitely one I was very proud of, in addition to working with Janelle. I'm still riffing off that. Sorry, Jan Janelle Monet and Lauren Hill. 1998, Miss Education of Lauren Hill. I remember that in my fifth form year. Sorry, I'm still riffing. That's amazing. So that's an incredible work. Um, preparation. Uh, actually, funny you mention that, bro, because the opportunity presented itself by way of Victoria Kelly uh, back in 2011. Yes, 2011. Um, very, very grateful to have had that opportunity. My dad is a, was a huge rugby fan, so um, I um, reveled in the fact that I got to Eden Park in the middle of Eden Park before he did. Um, <laughs> and he would have really, really enjoyed that fact too. But um, preparation, um, I wasn't allowed to tell anyone about it for like two months in the lead up to the opening ceremony. I was allowed to tell no one. I was. Uh, under a confidentiality, confidentiality uh, contract and so uh, as you can imagine that was a very hard task for someone in their mid-twenties to do to hold on to <laughs> that wonderful piece of information that I just really wanted to share with everyone but um, uh, preparation was um, everything was always mental for me just getting yourself into a right mental space prayer, karakia um, I was hanging with Petra Bagus, which was quite cool. Um, <laughs> I got my hair and makeup did. I had a fly dress that was um, made specifically for me, specifically for that event. So I think just like all the kind of niceties around it just really helped uh, with the performance aspect of it all. But it was, yeah, yeah, crack up that you mentioned that. It was Victoria that got me onto that. So, uh, <laughs> Seven, eight, seven years later, um, thank you very much for that opportunity. Chipo. Chipo, thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Uh, there's a big tension.
being from here and having uh, a voice and uh, ambitions and visions for yourself and your work and your message. And uh, we are at the bottom of the world, we're made aware of that very young. And of course that goes on to make us internalise cultural cringe and make us aspire to you know, the lofty heights of elsewhere, anywhere, we don't care, you know. And um, that's the big pop cultural byproduct, that anxiety of us feeling inadequacy on the world stage. Um, and that is only because of our isolation mm. and that has been severely radicalised in the last, you know, 20 years with the internet, obviously, where we've been revealed to ourselves. And we see that the things that we kind of loathed and tried to hide from the rest of the world, you know, um, are actually the things that make us incredible. That goes, um, that stems from our indigenous history right through to, you know, our environment, our land, our political history as a people. And um, we, for me personally as an artist, did I go through that? Yes. You know, I was a young artist and I just thought, bro, I'm gonna blow this place. And as I kind of developed my voice, I realized I can't be this person anywhere else. Yeah. You know, I can share my story and my messages with people on um, internationally, and I do, you know. I have a dynamic, you know, um, thank you powers high, that I'm able to kind of have this artery between me and the other places in the world. But if you don't collect the knowledge that you um, gain and bring it back home, it's what was it worth? You know, this is to improve my community and I'm a product of the South Pacific, I'm a product of Aotearoa and I need to respect and cultivate that respectfully and pay back where I'm from and I have to go out into the big, bigger world and learn more about myself and the world at large. That's, that's part of the psychic contract, so thank you for that. Um, just before Ebony mentioned a pinch myself moment, I would like to thank you all for a pinch myself moment. It's been such an honour to hear you and um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure everybody will share in that appreciation.